Well, I am delighted to welcome you here to hear the presentation from our 2013 Distinguished Research Award winner, Michael Allen. And you have a very lovely professional um, description, biography of Mike in your program, which details his long and illustrious career in a variety of things. Um, and yet, I think I still can share a couple of things about Mike because I've known him for going on 20 years now, <laughs> that uh, aren't in your program. Uh, one of them is one that's probably pretty widely known, and that's Mike's talents as a magician. Right? And so Mike is not just a Distinguished Research Award winner, but he's also a Distinguished Teaching Award winner, a prior recipient of the DTA here at UW Tacoma. And I seem to recall him doing some magic tricks when he received that award. So I don't know whether we'll see anything on that order today, but just as a tease. Um, another wonderful thing about Mike that I think very few people in the room are aware of is that Mike has the distinction of having been the coach for UW-Tacoma's only NCAA athlete, right? Yeah, we had a rodeo writer who competed uh, on the collegiate level, and, and Mike was the coach, right? The supervising uh, more or less, more or less. <laughs> by virtue of his expertise, which is detailed, and his long association with Ellensburg, I think he was by far the most qualified faculty member on campus to play that role. So that's another wonderful distinction that Mike has, in addition to being a founding faculty member here at UW Tacoma. But we are very excited to be here today to honor Mike's research, and uh, he has some work that is extremely well known. He has some work that is still in progress, and I think we're going to be hearing more good things from him in the coming years. So without further ado, I give you Mr. Mike Allen. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, since this is about uh, uh, my life, my, my real, my actual life, and then my intellectual life in low places, uh, we'll start out with a musical uh, prologue. <laughs> Can you hear that back there? Okay, we'll bring that back up at talks in so we can hear some more. There's a great line about the ivory tower in there that I want to play for you at the end. Uh, but um, and speaking of low places, uh, that's the first and last chance tavern in Ellensburg. And I started, uh, I started going in there when I got back from Vietnam. I'd always wanted to go in there, but I couldn't until I was 21, you know. And, uh, and I eventually became a bartender there. And, um, and I still go, a buddy of mine bought it a couple years ago, so I still go in there all the time. But um, um, I, when I got my job bartending at the first and last was um, right after I got my master's degree at the University of Montana. Uh, and then I went on, I was a towboat man after that. that was my to so that's what you do with a master's degree in history, okay? <laughs> you you uh, tin bar and, uh, and work on towboats. But, uh, yeah, this, is, uh, this talks about high and low culture, okay? And, I, and I, I don't mean that pejoratively at all. I'll tell you the truth, I prefer low, but I, I don't think, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think low is necessarily uh, uh, worse than high, or I just, uh, I just like both and have kind of dabbled in both, but I've always been drawn to the uh, lower. And that, that story then begins in Ellensburg um, at Allen's Ice Cream Shop in 1950. Um, and you see, you can barely see on the print there, ice cream, candies, fountain, and then sandwiches over in the, and that's the, that's the shop my dad built in Ellensburg in 1946. And he built it, get this, two blocks from the high school and three blocks from the college. 
And I, uh, I tell people this, that I grew up in Pop Tate's Soda Shop uh, from Archie Comics or something. But I mean, my earliest memories, and we lived in the back. So you see there's kind of a little backyard there. And we lived in the back until mom and dad got enough money to buy a house. And so my earliest memories are of all these teenagers, uh, you know, kids, because uh, they had a big lot out front. And they had dances in the lot. And so, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's where the story begins. Uh, here I am in the backyard, and this is a bad image, but if you look down there um, uh, on the lower part of the rocking horse, you can see a cowboy boot down there, and I'm uh, uh, trying out my dad's uh, cowboy boots and uh, getting ready to start in life. That's my dad and me, and again, we're in the backyard behind the, uh, behind the shop, and that's my sister Theresa, who is six years older than me and who lives in Yakima now. And I probably got a picture of mom and dad here, but um, it's a picture that's taken actually 15 years or so after these photographs. So it's chronologically out of order, which I never like when I'm doing a talk, but uh, it's a good picture of them. And this is probably early 70s. Look at that tie that my dad has. <laughs> you know, you can't, make, you can't make up stuff like that. <laughs> And so there, that picture is at Cleelum High School where my mom taught, uh, uh, she taught phys ed initially and then English um, and literature. She taught the Old Testament there as literature and uh, got a teaching job there. I, I can't say that, that I'm the first college graduate in my family because my mom earned her degree from Central the same year I graduated from Ellensburg High School. Uh, so we're both the first in our family to earn degrees. But she and dad had met at Whitman in the late 1930s, Whitman College, because dad had an ice cream shop there. And, oh geez, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> I, I tell my students, I owe you one, okay? Uh, but I can't turn that off because I gotta know what time it is. Okay, I'm really sorry. How embarrassing, oh geez. Uh, so uh, anyway, back to mom and dad. Um, um, they, uh, they represent a high-low uh, uh, juxtaposition, if you will, in that my mom aspired to art and literature and music and, and, was, uh, and taught English and was a dancer. Uh, she's also a candy maker, okay, uh, but, uh, uh, and when they came to Ellensburg, mom always said uh, uh, she came for the college and dad came for the rodeo. And that, and that was kind of, you know, and that was their dialectic, literally, uh, high and low. Because dad was, uh, he was a southern Idaho Mormon, and who had left the church. Oh, uh, mom, did I mention, is Jewish, uh, or was Jewish. Uh, she's deceased now. And so, yeah, this is a Mormon-Jewish uh, marriage. Um, and he came from Pocatello, Idaho, where um, he had grown up on a dry land wheat farm. And he was a cowboy of sorts, but they'd lost their farm. So we always had horses around and we lived on the edge of town, had horses and a steer and uh, you know he played at farming but in fact he ran an ice cream shop. Uh, he also dabbled in politics, Republican politics and was the mayor of Ellensburg for five or six years but you know uh, dad never intellectualized anything uh, and mom intellectualized everything <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, they were you know they, they kind of had a, a, a symbi symbiotic uh, relationship. So uh, this, is, but this is actually after we got our own house, and this is in the lot behind there. And look at that dog. Um, that's a poodle, okay? And this is when poodles were poodles, okay? <laughs> I mean, that's a, you know, that's a dog. That's a real dog. And somehow in the 60s and 70s, all of that was bred out of them somehow. But yeah, that was a great dog, jeez. And... Uh, you know, I don't know whether it's because I'm little or those fish are big, but boy, those are some good. We pulled those trout out of Tainum Creek, you know, which is a creek that comes out of the Cascades into the Yakima River. And those are some pretty good looking fish there. And I'm sure they're cutthroat. I'm sure they're native trout. So the fishing was so much better back then, you know, and uh, everything's gone downhill. And, uh, and uh, so here we have one of my first business cards uh, that I had in Ellensburg. Uh, I started doing magic when I was eight and really remained very interested in magic until I was, oh, 14 or 15. I'm still doing magic, but I wanted to be a professional magician initially and until I was 14 or 15 and then finally realized that when you have hands that are that big, you ain't going to be a professional magician, you know, and so, but I always kept up at it and still do magic shows 
uh, around town. And um, yeah, and so that's how I got the teaching award. I was a magician before I, uh, before I, and you know, it's all entertainment, man. It's all entertainment. And so, um, now speaking of entertainment, this is my next uh, stage. This is Dick Turpin and the Knight Riders, famous Ellensburg rock and roll band, uh, circa 1967. And as you can see, and those of you who are from the Northwest, there's a real Pacific Northwest influence there. Paul Revere and the Raiders influence, uh, which was, uh, it means choreography. We actually did steps and, and that. But because it's 67, there's also a British, in, we had a British invasion uh, influence because of the Beatles and especially the Rolling Stones. Uh, and then R&B. Uh, and so, you know, we... Uh, we did everything from uh, I'm a Believer by the Monkees to Walking the Dog by Rufus Thomas. And, um, and uh, that didn't work out either, okay? But for, <laughs> but for a couple of years, we really ruled the roost at Ellensburg High School. I mean, we, were, you know, we won the battle of the bands. Uh, we traveled as far east as Clelum and as far west as Othello. <laughs> And, uh, and we did play at Central Washington State College. We played in the ballroom at Central Washington State College. Which guys do there? Uh, I'm on the right uh, at the organ. Uh, and I've got those funny looking black boots on. Uh, and uh, I can play three chords in five or six different keys, okay? <laughs> uh, okay, here we are back at Ellensburg High School. And uh, this is my senior year. Uh, trying to be a smart aleck, obviously, with a Napoleon pose. And, um, I, you know, my hair is not straight, you know that. And obviously, I had done something to get it straight, something horrible to get it straight at that time. And I'm lucky to have any laugh, tell you the truth. Uh, but not only did you have to do something horrible to get your hair straight, but then every night you had to soak it in dippity doo and scotch tape it to your side. Yeah, you can't make up stuff like that. Okay. And so, yeah, there, uh, there I am. And uh, now that's a pretty bad picture, but uh, the hair is still there. And um, I, beca I became an anti-communist uh, in about seventh or eighth grade. I think, and, and uh, that which is right about the time the Vietnam War was winding up uh, with Kennedy sent the initial troops then. And then Goldwater came along in 1964 and it was almost like it was meant to be, you know, and I became a Goldwaterite and I still am a Goldwaterite. And um, here, this particular picture, which is another smart aleck picture, uh, is if you look in the back there, and it's real bad quality, there's a saguaro cactus in the back there. And we were down, we were down in Arizona at some kind of a political camp, uh, me and a couple of buddies of mine. And we were near uh, Camelback, and we actually went over to Goldwater's house. We walked over there, it was like three or four miles, and it was hot. And um, we walked over there, and the senator was not there, but the, and you know, this would never happen today, the guy taking care of the pool invited us in. <laughs> And I was in Goldwater's uh, radio room. He had a, he's a ham radio operator. I was in his radio room. And um, um, there was a, he had photographs on the wall. And I remember one photograph was Lyndon B. Johnson. And it said, to Barry from your target, Lyndon. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> so we transitioned from anti-communism and... Uh, in the Goldwater movement to my joining the Marine Corps in 1968. And I had actually been a, I'd been at Central for a couple, of, I went to college at Central for a couple of quarters, fall and winter, and I was a political science major. And it was awful. And, uh, and cause all the political science professors were doing was protesting the Vietnam War, you know. And uh, so, but I took a Western Civ class from a guy named Zoltan Kramar and I, and I realized I wanted to be a historian. You know, it was great. I loved it. Uh, but first I wanted to join the Marine Corps. And so in December of 68 then I joined the Marine Corps. And I had a brief uh, and inglorious uh, career in the Marine Corps. Uh, this is, uh, I always, this is in Vietnam uh, and that's a 155 millimeter howitzer shell. And I always thought this would make a good Christmas card. <laughs> uh, just fooling. And uh, here's my, I was a gun chief on a 155 millimeter howitzer crew. And I, I, as I finished up, I rose in the ranks. I, I rose to the rank of sergeant eventually. Uh, I'm on the left there. It's a bad picture, 
I'm on the left. This is F Troop, obviously. Uh, <laughs> that guy in the middle, uh, you know, who looks a little bit too big to be a Marine, you know, I got a little... Uh, we called him Pop because he was 24. <laughs> He's an old guy, you know, we called him Pop. And that guy next to him, to the right of Pop, is Jimmy Herlihy, who was my best friend, uh, who I'm still in touch with. Jimmy Herlihy from Bill Ricca, Massachusetts, who I'm still in touch with. And that's me and Jimmy on a uh, 155 howitzer. And he's got that Band-Aid across his head because he had been great. He'd been grazed by that cannon because he's a, he was a hot dog. He was a hot dog on a howitzer, and he had been grazed by that cannon. And uh, anyway, so that's what I did in Vietnam. And uh, I was blessed because I was in Vietnam in 1969 which those of you who are historians know was a much better year to be in Vietnam than 1968. And so, uh, anyway, yeah, I came back uh, unscathed. Uh, some claim I was psychologically scathed uh, from Vietnam, but I, I, uh, I was not and have never claimed to be a vic victim of the Vietnam War. And I came back to basically the possibility of becoming a professional student for the next 10 or 15 years. Because in Washington, they had a Vietnam tuition freeze. Uh, if somebody could get that, that'd be great. They had a Vietnam veterans tuition freeze. And so for the rest of my academic career, as long as I stayed in the state, I paid $270 a quarter to go to school. And so I, I earned a PhD at UW in 1985, paying $270 a quarter to go to school there. Uh, I'm going to skip chronologically again. What happened after Vietnam is I came back and I went to Central and I got a bachelor's degree in history from Central Washington State College and wrote a senior paper, and then I went on to the University of Montana in Missoula, which I'm going to mention in just a second here, but um, I, um, the, because we're talking about male occupational folk culture, and one of my points today is that I spent a lot of time in all-male work environments, and I eventually ended up writing about all-male. I wrote two books about all-male work environments, and so I'm going to skip ahead seven years to after I got my MA uh, when I went, uh, went to work on the Mississippi River. Yeah, that's a Superman t-shirt. And uh, that VTS had as Valley Towing Service in Greenville, Mississippi, uh, where I got my first towboat job. And then I, uh, I soon went up to St. Louis and got into the Seafarers International Union up there. And I was the last of the inland uh, boating union members because the union really died soon thereafter on Western Rivers. But this is, um, I'm wearing, I, I, I soon realized that I was dangerous as a deckhand and that I could get into terrible trouble. And so I became a cook because my dad had owned restaurants and I knew you know, how to do that. And so I became a cook for National Marine Service in St. Louis and made pretty good money uh, with a master's degree in history, you know. And, and, and I worked on the Missis upper and lower Mississippi and the Illinois and the Washita and the Ar we took the Arkansas River up to Catoosa, Oklahoma one time and we used to take the Illinois River, uh, is David Morris here? We, uh, we used to take the Illinois River um, up to uh, Joliet, Illinois and uh, but I'll tell you something, my favorite trip was between Dubuque and St. Paul during the summer pushing hot oil, man. It was just gorgeous up there and Dubuque, Iowa to St. Paul, Minnesota. It was just gorgeous and that's the National Gateway which is one of the Boats that I, and so I did that for three years because I'll tell you something, I was waiting for the market to get better in academia because those of you, and some of you in this room know what I'm talking about. We're talking 70s, 1970s, and I want to get a PhD, but the market was lousy. So I kept waiting for it to get better, and it never got better. Uh, but um, I made enough money that I could go to Europe after that. And, and then I came back and got a PhD at UW. Um, and incidentally, Bill, Bill Rohrbaugh, who is my advisor, from UW is right here. Raise your hand. Uh, I did my PhD dissertation with Bill Rohrbaugh, who's right here. And yeah, thanks for coming, Bill. Uh, now, before we get to UW in Seattle, this is the Ellensburg Rodeo Parade in 1974, right before I went to Missoula. And I'm a magician on the back of a wagon there. And then we switched to Missoula, Montana, uh, where I lived from 1974 to 77, three of the best years of my life in Missoula, Montana, and uh, wrote a master's thesis that no one should have ever allowed me to write because it was 300 pages long, and I don't know, and it was like a, it was like a bad doctoral dissertation is what it was, but it eventually, uh, it eventually became this book, and so uh, 
I'll, I'll begin the high culture part of the program now, except that, <laughs> except that it's, the high culture part is the low culture, low culture part. Uh, this is actually a fairly civilized topic. I was doing political, when I started out, everybody was doing political history. And so I wrote a senior paper on the Federalists in the West, and then I went to Montana, and I wrote a, uh, a master's thesis on the Continental Congress, uh, the Revolutionary Congress in the West, land policy, Indian policy, uh, territorial government, uh, diplomatic negotiations. And my thesis was that the Federalist Party was a reluctant expansionist party, that it was much, more, much less enthusiastic about westward expansion than the Jeffersonians and later Jacksonians. And the reason for that, of course, was because frontiersmen tended to vote for the Jeffersonians and the Jacksonians, uh, you know, and that's the origins of the Democrat Party in the Trans-Appalachian West. Uh, the other reason uh, Federalists were against expansion was slavery always went with expansion. And later the Whig Party and the GOP were also reluctant expansionist parties until Abraham Lincoln, you know, uh, developed free soil and the free soil doctrine and then um, they became a party of what westward expansion. So this is what I was doing, but uh, as many of you know, political history was over in the 1970s. Political history was dying and the new social history movement was arising. And I showed up at UW in 1981 and, and talked to Bill Rohrbaugh. And what I was going to do, John Jay had offered to um, forego navigation of the Mississippi River for 25 years to the Spaniards. And he was going to, uh, um, uh, because he didn't want people going west, but all, also because the Spanish owned New Orleans and, uh, you know, you don't need to know any more than that. It's kind of a boring topic, actually. But he was willing to forego navigation. And it really, it really angered these western rivermen, these riverboat men, flatboatmen, keelboatmen. I'm not talking steam. I'm talking pre-steam boatmen out there. It really angered them. And so John Jay then gave the whole thing up. And so I had this chapter on John Day Jay, and I talked to Bill Rohrbaugh about it. And he says, why don't you just, he says, why don't you skip John Jay and do flatboat men and do a social history of flatboat men because nobody's ever done it before. And Bill had just written The Alcoholic Republic and had done some things on flatboat men. And so uh, my doctoral dissertation then um, became Western Riverman, which was published by LSU Press, Louisiana State University Press. And um, um, was, you know, I mean, my favorite book, my first book, and uh, uh, the, um, it was twofold. It was the social history of flatboatmen, but then it also dealt with their mythic dimension. Uh, because they were kind of like folk heroes. They were the truck drivers of the, of the 1790s and early 19th century. Uh, people mythologized them. And they show up in songs. Uh, the term alligator horse is a folk expression to refer to their, their propensity for violence, uh, but also trickster behavior. Uh, you know, they're, uh, they're trickster folk heroes who existed in real life. And obviously there's some difference between the historic boatman and the mythic boatman, but there's also overlap. And so that's what I, that's what I did in the book and was working on that. And my thesis was that uh, they became immensely popular during the age of Jackson, which was the Industrial Revolution, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And so industrializing Americans then become, become nostalgic for us, what they see as a vanishing frontier past. And Davy Crockett comes along the same time. James Fenimore Cooper wrote Last of the Mohicans, exactly the same period of time here. And so basically this is the beginning of the Western what we call Westerns, but it's the Trans-Appalachian West, not the, not the Trans-Mississippi uh, uh, West, not the Saguaro Cactus West, uh, the, uh, the green, verdant uh, West of the Mississippi Valley. Um, well, uh, and then I, I came to UWT in 1990, and I had that book with me when I came, and I, I got tenure with that book, and then this is my full professorship, this book right here, and uh, published in 1998. Uh, after my dad had died, uh, it's kind of a tribute to him, really, because he was so active in the rodeo. And uh, in this book, I kind of did the same sort of thing. Did a social history of rodeo cowboys, but then looked at the mythic dimension, and much more on the mythic side. So there was a chapter on movies. There was a chapter on literature. There was a chapter on country music. Uh, there was a chapter on art. Uh, why? Because I was teaching in an interdisciplinary program and, an inter and all of a sudden I could do this stuff that I'd always been wanting to do that I hadn't been trained to do. 
which is art history and music history, ethnomusicology, and all of that. And so uh, the rodeo book was kind of like the riverboat book, except that rodeo cowboys are modern. They're literally 20th, and so that was the interesting part. And I, I picked up this term used by others called contemporary ancestor, uh, which uh, refers to people like stock car racers or astronauts or, or others who are modern, yet somehow represent frontier characteristics or old. Uh, Sergeant Alvin York always comes to mind, the great hero of World War I, who was a Tennessee mountaineer who uh, uses those skills then to help America win World War I. And, and there's a lot of different, uh, Amelia Earhart also comes to, to mind here, uh, contemporary ancestors, individualistic frontier folk heroes in a modern time. And so that's what the, that's what the rodeo book was. And then I got into his, historiography and um, we had this uh, book, which was basically a critique of the new Western history, uh, which had arisen, which was a neo-Marxist school of, uh, of historiography, which had arisen in the 1980s and 90s. And, uh, you know, had some fun with that for about 10 years and got into some trouble, you know, and uh, caused some hard feelings and, um, and stopped going to meetings. And, um, but that got me into historiography and also a criticism of what the history field had become and what was going on in American history. And, uh, you know, uh, the Patriot's History, which was published in 2004, was sort of an answer to the, uh, the neo-Marxist um, uh, historiography and methods of the 1970s and 80s and 90s. And uh, the book's success, as you know, and you've all heard this story before, was basically an accident. Uh, we had sold, uh, we'd sold about 25,000 copies of this book. Uh, I wrote with Larry Swikert from the University of Dayton. And he wrote most of it. I, I wrote about five chapters. And we, you know, we wrote it. We sold 25,000 copies. It was great. And then, as some of you recall, uh, one day Glenn Beck held it up on television. He held it right in front of the camera. And, you know, he probably had it up five, ten seconds. And then that took three weeks to become a New York Times number one bestseller. And, um, you know, it was really a blessing. Uh, you know, it was just a blessing. And I paid off the truck, put a <laughs> roof on the house, new crowns, four crowns. <laughs> And then I took that 15-month sabbatical instead of the three-month budget sabbatical. I took the 15-month sabbatical, and and so uh, yeah, it was great. And uh, uh, I always say about the Patriots' history, it's not a uh, you know, it's not a my country right or wrong book, uh, but it's not a my country is always wrong book. And that's what we were trying to do. I say yeah. I mean, you want to find some ugliness, no problem. Uh, do a little American history. You can find all kinds of ugly things. But you're going to find a lot of good things, too. And indeed, the good outweighs the bad. Uh, and, uh, you know, people used to say, well, is the, is the cup half empty or half full? And we decided it was two-thirds full. <laughs> and so that was the Patriots' history. And uh, uh, people always ask me how I met Larry to do the book. And, and let me just tell you, in the entire, in, in North America, there's about 250 Republican college professors, okay? <laughs> and we all know each other. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? <laughs> no, not kidding. Oh, speaking of not kidding, uh, you know, I was really treated respectfully and very well on this campus when this book came out. Pat Spakes was chancellor, and, you know, it was great. And, but if I can just get a little dig in here, you know, uh, uh, you know, on main campus, this book was never mentioned. It, and I don't know, is that like a number one New York Times bestseller? And I'm an alum. And no, I don't, I don't want to be mean-spirited here or anything, but, uh, you know, I mean, wouldn't you think um, there might be something about it? I mean, you know, how many faculty read a number one New York Times bestseller? And alums. I wonder how come, you know, I wonder how come. Uh, you know, and, you know, that's how we, that's one of the ways we celebrate diversity. Okay. Uh, and there's some kinds of diversity that we don't celebrate. And this is one of those kinds. Uh, the, sorry, I couldn't resist. Okay. <laughs> couldn't resist. This is my first scholarly presentation on campus. Probably my last scholarly presentation. <laughs> this is the Patriots Reader. You know, everybody's got to have a spin-off. And this is actually a documents book. And um, it's, you know, the Constitution, the Mayflower Compact, uh, 
uh, basically the documents book that every American historian who's teaching the 200 level might have to assign to the students and so uh, that's done very well. And that moves me to the Mississippi Valley. And it's four o'clock, so I think I'm going to make this short and sweet. And also, it's a gorgeous day. And, uh, you know, and I want to say right now at this time, I mean, you've heard the whole spiel, uh, including, including the politics at the end. And, so, and I know some of you are busy, and I do not in any way, uh, uh, I'm not in any way uh, bothered if you have to go, because we will have a little Q&A, is that okay? But I'm not kidding you. Uh, please, if you got something to do or you want to enjoy this gorgeous day, no problem whatsoever. Okay, I'm serious. And uh, I know because I find scholarly presentations to be fairly painful myself, and uh, I'm always trying to figure out, you know, how I can always sit in the back, you know, and s slide out. But uh, this is the Mississippi Valley, and if you didn't get, a, uh, if you didn't get an outline when you came in on the, on the back table there, there's an outline of this book that I'm almost done writing. I've still got a couple of chapters to go here. And this is the kind of book that you save up, you know, until you finally have the energy to uh, write it. I'd been thinking about it for 40 or 45 years, and, and it's going to be called uh, Mississippi. You know, I, fig I just figured out I don't have one of these things, okay? <laughs> and somebody, oh, thanks. It's called Mississippi River Valley. The Course of American Civilization. The, that, uh, the, the first title, Kind of Solemn and Awful Grand, is taken from Huckleberry Finn. It's a couple of comments that Huck makes during their, uh, during their journey. And as you can see, this is going to be an interdisciplinary book. Uh, there'll be a couple of historical chapters, but only two. And then there's a lot of cultural geography here. There's environmental science here. The prologue is in, uh, environmental science. And uh, then a lit chapter and a movie chapter, and um, ethnomusicology, and two folklore chapters, or folk life chapters, and then the epilogue will be ethnomusicology. So I start with John Audubon, John James Audubon, and with Bob Dylan, and uh, The Direction Home. And um, it, these little sections in between are just topics that I decided to write about. There's no way you can write a history of the Mississippi Valley. Okay, so I, I picked little stories, histories, if you will, that I would include under every section, which is actually a technique I learned from Daniel Borston, uh, whose work I adored in the Americans, where he just he selected vignettes or stories, and those stories reflected uh, larger stories or things he wanted to do. And so that's what I'm working on right now, and I really hope to finish it in the next year or two. But uh, that's all I got for you, so uh, I'm going to open it up to questions, but I do encourage you, if you want to enjoy this beautiful day or anything, by all means, get out of here, you know, I understand. <laughs> I understand completely. And so, is there anything you'd like to talk about? Now that we've talked about what I want to talk about, is there anything you'd like to talk about? What's a liver-eating capitalist? Uh, a mountain man. And uh, the expression liver-eating applied to Jeremiah Johnson, who was called liver Eaton Johnson. And, about 50 years ago, Bill Getzman wrote an article called The Mountain Man with Jacksonian Man, in which he argued these guys are all just a bunch of entrepreneurs. They are not wild, rugged, woolly frontiersmen. They're all a bunch of capitalists on the make. And he proved it. And so I borrowed that from Bill Getzman, uh, but not the liver-eating part. So why are bears in bold Oh, they shouldn't be in bold type. The question is, why are bears in bold type? But that's a little uh, prologue, starting with William Faulkner, and the bear, and then by way of Teddy Roosevelt's uh, hunting expedition uh, in Mississippi, uh, and Thomas Bangs Thorpe's short story, The Big Bear of Arkansas, kind of meanders through stories about bear hunting. Davy Crockett is in there, you know, there's all kinds of good bear hunting, but they're, they're metaphoric. They, uh, you know, that's the vanishing, the bear in Faulkner's story is the vanishing Mississippi forest. And it's always the same story. It's all about the vanishing frontier, okay? Even though I don't think any of us would really want to have lived on the vanishing frontier, uh, you know, Americans can't get over it. And we still can't get over it. And I mean all Americans, whether you go to a farmer's market, um, you know, or, or to, the, uh, you know, to the Whole Foods grocery store for the organic food, or whether you see some character in a Jeep with a gun, gun rack in the back, heading up in the woods, these guys are all looking for the Garden of Eden. You know, they're, uh, they're all looking for America. 
And we say they're different, REI, you know, you drive Interstate, interstate uh, 5, there's that REI rock climbing wall right off the interstate. And you know, what are, what are they doing? They're, they're looking for America, they're looking for the frontier. And some of them are on the far right, and some of them are supposedly on the far left, but you know, they're all Americans. And incidentally, this Jeep with the gun rack I just referred to, uh, who's behind him going up uh, Interstate 90, but the Subaru out back with the kayak on the top, okay? And they're both the same character, more or less. Uh, but I, I digress. Uh, I don't know. Uh, how did I get off onto that? Uh, uh, questions or comments? What movies are you doing in the... Uh well, I divide them into categories. I did music, I did the Iowa musicals, you know, like uh, The Music Man and um, um, uh, Meet Me in St. Louis, not, not Iowa, but um, The Music Man. And then I did Pajama Game, which is set in Dubuque. And so I did, I did musicals. Uh, but then I, I did, you know, I did In the Heat of the Night and, uh, and To Kill a Mockingbird, the movie uh, version. And so, um, I did documentaries. There's a thing on Ken Burns in there. America's, it says America's greatest historian. And the, which, the, in the historical profession, Ken Burns is not a particularly popular guy. He just happens to be America's greatest historian. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know anything about your work on the all-male working environments, some of the early stuff. You could well, um, folklorists call it uh, male occupational uh, work environments, or, or, and uh, that would include um, uh, today, uh, like in North Dakota right now, this, all this oil drilling that's going on, those are largely male, um, male environments, uh, sometimes almost exclusively so. And so I w I've always been interested. I tell my students this, I say, you know, the reason I'm eccentric is because I've spent five years of my life either, you know, uh, in the Marine Corps riding around boats, on boats with other guys. And, uh, and I was always interested in that, but not enough to keep doing it for a living. <laughs> no, seriously. If you worked on the Mississippi River for 30 years, you would spend 20 years of your life on a towboat with a bunch of guys. And then you'd spend 10 years at home with your family. And so I never wished to pursue it, but I was interested in it. And there's a lot of oral tradition in environments like that, and a lot of good social history, and a lot of ugliness, and violence, and um, racism. And uh, so I was interested in it, and learned, and, and the rodeo thing was an offshoot of that. But, uh, you know, as a contemporary ancestor, the rodeo cowboy kind of has his wilderness and eats it too, because as soon as the rodeo cowboy is done in the arena, he jumps into a truck and checks into a motel and, uh, you know, and goes to the next rodeo. But he's still acting out those old, uh, those old traits. And, they, and in, in many senses, the, in many ways, this folk hero is a male folk hero. What's interesting in the 20th century and 21st, now Danica Patrick in the NASCAR, for example, I'm writing about that right now and Amelia Earhart, who I mentioned earlier, or the movie Thelma and Louise. Uh, what happens in the 20th century is that women are woven into this mythic uh, uh, frontier paradigm. And uh, that's, that's important. Uh, that really didn't answer your question, but that's, that's what male occupational folk culture is. It's all male work groups, and you can go at them from a number. But in a way, you know, I'm doing gender studies, really. <laughs> you know. Uh, but, um, well, what else? and actually I've seen some emails that evidently there's other people around here doing gender studies from the, from the male side. Uh, other questions or, yeah? You mentioned, uh, Mike, that you, you took a class in history in, in college and you said that's it. So what was it? What, what Western was it? What Civ. Was it? Western Civ. And I'm teaching ancient history right now, incidentally, uh, a field in which I have no training whatsoever. And I love it. And so I learned it. And it was ancient history, the first part of the Western Sev sequence. And this guy was a Hungarian uh, refugee. He'd gotten a PhD at Nebraska after left, uh, leaving Hungary in 1955. wonder how come he left Hungary in 1955. <laughs> and um, his name was Zoltan Kramar. And, you know, and he's doing the, the Spartans at Thermopylae. And I'm thinking, wow, this is better than political science. <laughs> Yeah, Joe. Um, what, uh, say, a TV show, maybe sitcom, do you think is uh, most expressive of America? Oh, geez, today? Uh, anytime. Uh, 
Well, I, you know, I mean, I've watched a ton. Yeah, yeah, well, I've watched a ton of Andy Griffith shows. Okay, and my favorite Andy Griffith, and incidentally, there's others. There's, there, there's modern shows that use this wild, tame uh, dialectic, you know, uh, Northern Exposure, for example. You take city people and put them into the wilderness, and that's American art. You got wilderness and civilization, and, you know, and Green Acres is the worst case scenario, but uh, <laughs> at, it, at its best, no, you know, I mean, really. Uh, at a, the Bear by Faulkner is the best case scenario. But at its best, uh, in the Andy Griffith show, there's an episode called Man in a Hurry. Some of you have probably seen this in old black and white. It's about this character from Raleigh, the big city, whose car breaks down in Mayberry. And uh, he's got to get to a big meeting in Raleigh, and, uh, he's, it, and he shows up on a Sunday, and of course, he can't get anything done on Sunday. There's no way. And they're all, they're all at church. This is when television shows had church in them. And, uh, and so he's absolutely fit to be tied. And finally, slowly, as the half hour progresses, he, become, he comes to appreciate that and remembers that he knows something about this. And it all happens on the front porch when Andy and Barney uh, sing Church in the Wildwood. And they go, come to the church in the wildwood. And, uh, and it's actually a pretty good episode. It won an Emmy. The camera sweeps up this fellow's uh, to his face, and he's singing the song. He's singing because he remembers that uh, they did, he'd learned it as a child, and so that was a long. I like the Andy Griffith show, but to tell you the truth, this these sorts of things show up. I mean, like Toy Story, you got a space age character and you got a cowboy character, and so uh, you know, wilderness and civilization. It begins, if you will, with uh, the alligator horse, James Fenimore Cooper, Last of the Mohicans, and we're still fooling around with it, and it shows up in all kinds of popular culture venues. Also shows up at the farmer's market, as I, as I was just arguing, you know, and gr the green movement, and, uh, you know, we're all still looking for America. Something's been lost, and yet would any of us give up penicillin and hot showers and microwave them? <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, as a former Memphian, uh, I wonder what you do with Stax stack, Records. And also in the end of Bob Dylan. Well, uh, for Stax, uh, you have an integrated music studio that be then becomes, uh, uh, after the assassination of Dr. King, uh, becomes uh, uh, troubled and, and, and their strife, and eventually they go bankrupt. And so I think that's the interesting story there, especially with the horn section and that integrated horn section and Donald Duck Dunn and, you know, these guys that show up in the Blues Brothers. Uh, so I think that's the story there with Stax Records. For Dylan, my story is, begins with him getting booed off the, well, first it begins in a the upper Mississippi River Valley in Minnesota, where he was born and raised in Hibbing, then goes to Minneapolis, and then records the Highway 61 album, which is about the Great River Road that parallels the Mississippi River from Twin Cities to New Orleans. But the real story I'm going to tell is when he's booed off the stage in, uh, at Newport and uh, wanders around for a couple of years and finally ends up in Nashville, Tennessee, um, and records an album called the Nashville Skyline album. And then from there goes down to Muscle Shoals where he records the two Christian albums. And, you know, still searching. And then he ends up in New Orleans, which is in the Chronicles. And he devotes about 20% of the Chronicles to talking about making an album in New Orleans. And I think that's where I'll end it up. And so that's the direction home. Uh, New Orleans by way of Muscle Shoals in Nashville. So if you're, if you're lost and confused, okay, that's the direction home. Mike, why is it taking you 40 years? Hmm? Why is it taking you 40 years to deliver this particular Well, book? you know, I went to Harry Fritz at Montana, and I said, I want to do this for my master's thesis, and he said, you're out of your mind. <laughs> and then Bill and I got talking, I told him I wanted to do it for my master's thesis, and he says, you're out of your mind. <laughs> and, so, and then after a while, I figured out you really need you need 40 years to do something like this. You know, this isn't something you do when you're 25. You wait until you have learned something. And then maybe you could write a book like this. But it's, <laughs> it's gone on a long time. I've got the outline I made in Missoula, Montana in 1976. <laughs> so how much has changed in the outline since then? Oh, yeah. It's funny. Yeah. It just, yeah. No, not totally. It was that, originally it was going to be called Highway 61 Revisited. So Dylan was always. Oh yeah, Dylan. Yeah, yeah. It's all. It all gets back to Dylan. You know. Uh, now there is a great American. 
mobbed him. Uh, I'm going to end it there, but I'm going to stick around. I'd like to talk to anyone who wants to stick around, okay? Is that okay? Thanks.